Hello, Joe. Hello, Joe. Hello. So, Prabhakar Sadhvai is my classmate. But why is not able to see each other? See him. Why did you come on this side? Hello. Hi, uh, yeah, Joe. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? No, I didn't just switch. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Yeah, you are, I just kept the sound mute now. So are you now? If you're, uh, are you able to hear me now? Yeah, I can hear, hear you. Yeah. Can you switch okay. on your video, please? I have switched on the video. Okay, my, right, right. my video is on. All right, okay. I think it's a it's a ultra wave. Yeah, wave X me ultra. Sorry. Hello. I can hear you. I can see you now. Okay, okay. So I'm yes. uh, yeah. Okay, very good. Right. Now we have a few minutes more. Okay. So I've not seen your presentation because it just came in. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just sitting with it last minute, playing with it. <laughs> sorry. But what I do in, I mean I put a separate slide, the the break slides. Uh I have yet to see your slides. You didn't send me by email. You sent it. By okay, email. I can just send it by email. I can just send it by email. Uh, no, it's okay. I can look at uh, WhatsApp. Just hold on. All right. Okay. Yeah, I can. Uh, no, I don't have your uh, presentation. Okay, I'll just send it by. Yeah. No. Yeah. So how do I go back to here? here? Just email you, sir. Please take it. Why did you come? No, just.
Joe, you can uh, you can send me by WhatsApp. Okay, I can send it by WhatsApp also. Yeah. I just emailed you. You know, WhatsApp I sent it. I already it's, it's on your WhatsApp. Uh, no. What you sent me up till now is your uh, the presentation has drawn from. Uh, there is no presentation there. There is only the book that you published. No, 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 no. That's not the one. It's um, I mean the presentation is on PPT. I'm just sending again. Yeah, I've just sent it right away. Okay, it's it's still coming. No. Cisco. There is a large presentation. Okay, I got your PPT now. Okay. Okay, so I know where the breaks are. They also have to So, what are here? Yeah, because they are between this and this, right? And uh, that is here. Okay. So, what are Yes, I think we are. Uh, Joe, we are about to start, right? Can you see the PPT now on the screen? Yes, I got, I got, I got your PPT. But can you see it on the screen? I'm just um, showing it on the screen. Uh, no. Okay. No, it doesn't matter. I, I don't. When you start sharing it, I will see it. Is yeah, can I share it? I'm testing it and sharing it. Okay, test it. This is better. This I don't need it. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I, I start by welcoming, right? Sorry? I start by welcoming everyone. Uh, we have a few minutes. We have a five two. I'm just sending my, sharing my PPT, then I'm done. Okay. Yes, okay, some, it's not coming through. There are some issues with that. Okay. You, you want some help? Yeah, I'm just um, doing the sharing of the PPT. Yes. And I just want to know whether you can see it now. Uh, no. Um, something went wrong. I can't share it from here. Uh huh. So I'm thinking what to do now. Uh, just a minute. Will you, be, will you be able to do it from there, please? Uh, or I may to shut down. I may to uh, exit and come back. I, I have to see uh, whatever the uh, PPT you sent to me. Yeah. Green. So if you want, well, I, uh, I can share that. Provided. Please, 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 can you share it? Let's see then. Yeah. Give, give me the permission. Yeah, yeah I, I think you have the permission. This one? No, I don't have permission. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, maybe I, but I did decide to come back. And change my name. Yeah, now, now, now I have. Now I have. Just see whether you can do it now. Uh, yes, I can see something coming. Yeah, show me again. Show me again. Should I, should I, should I share it? Yeah, please try. Yeah. Hmm? Here. This or this? Can you can you see it now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now it's okay. So should I operate it? Please, if you could. Sorry. If you could, I can't do it from my side. Okay, okay. Yeah, you can begin, but then um, just just demo, show the slides one by one, not the side one. Yeah, yeah. I okay, shall we begin? You can begin now. Yeah. I'll close it now. Yeah, we are ready. Let's go. We are online. So when I start this video, we'll go. Okay, I start by welcoming. Yes, please. Let's go. Yes. Oh. 
ओके आई स्टार्ट जो आयु दे ओके सो वी आर अबाउट फोर्टी पार्टिसिपेंट्स एट प्रेजेंट हेलो वेलकम टू एवरी वन माय नेम इज राजेंद्र शिंदे आई एम आई आई टी एलमनाय एंड फॉर्मर डायरेक्टर एट यूनाइटेड नेशन इनवाइट प्रोग्राम and i am very pleased to be uh, here as a moderator of uh, today's uh, event which is basically on uh, organized on an occasion of world senior citizenship day world senior citizens day and the topic of our uh, webinar today is related to ageism the topic is uh, totally a bit outside the usual box because the senior citizens problems many times people talk about their old age health issues their pension issues and their dependence on people these are the immediate things that come to our mind when we talk about them. but we never think about certain basic issues they are and we think about it because we feel that their time is gone their innings are over and uh, then we start excluding them from our societal systems and take them as a sort of a burden as something as a waste something as a garbage sometimes and something where probably they have to be taken care of somehow till they end their innings from this world totally Well, that is my short introduction. But it is, it is also the subject is also to be related to COVID nineteen, which we will hear from our main speaker, Dr. Dick Thomas. But let me tell you that COVID nineteen has highlighted brand new challenges that plague our societies. and it has also exposed us the major systematic fragilities one thing that has totally left mankind exposed is the shock of covid-19 and for the first time we realized that we are perfect not resilient to the upheaval caused by covid-19 at planetary scale what we are facing today is not a shock arising out of global war to yahan tumhara naam but it is a shock given by micro organism that is our enemy today that enters into our bodies in spite of our all radar systems our testing surveillance vaccine development systems and we even don't know what is happening to this enemy when it enters and how it is to be dealt with and when it will be really the war will be over and here comes the one dimension of it that is old people are more susceptible they are they are most affected by this kind of microorganism there is a age old saying that prevention is better than cure but even we don't know what is the prevention because and here comes the subject of today that such experience of prevention up till now we have totally eliminated from our society because that experience lies with the old generation 
So we don't know even mention experiences of the old generation because senior citizens, aged people, excluded. And today we have Dr. Joe Thomas to talk exactly about this issue. The World Health Organization has taken up this issue as a priority because the children are always encouraged along with the adults, but the old people are excluded and their experience and their knowledge, proven knowledge, proven failures, proven successes have been totally neglected from our learning process. And we have here none other than Dr. Thomas to tell us about it. What exactly this movement of ageism that WHO speaks about. Dr. Thomas has worked as an executive director of environmental organization called as a Partners in Population Development. But most relevant to this paper today or our presentation today is that he is a founding director general of Global Commission on Aging and particularly aging in the developed countries like India, China, Africa, and some of the South Asian and Asia Pacific and Latin America. It's technical support, extensively traveled in more than 50 countries and worked closely with World Bank, WHO, of course, UNHCR, UNAIDS, UNFPA, UNICEF, and he worked in those countries to set up and think about what more can be done about our health systems. So without wasting further time, I hand it over to Joe and uh, I will be the one who will be showing you the slides and sharing it with my computer. So let me start sharing it. Joe, the floor is yours. Hope everybody is seeing, able to see it, including Joe. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Dr. Joe Thomas. Uh, Joe, you are muted. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, thank you for all the participants for uh, coming on board to discuss about uh, one of the important uh, social phenomena. Aging is a natural process, but we make it a um, bit complicated by looking at it in a different perspective, or probably still it is time to look at aging from a new perspective. Our understanding about aging itself is an old, uh, old framework. Maybe that is my opening statement. <clears throat> when we look at uh, aging, there are different ways to look at this phenomena. Some people say senior citizen, some people say retired person, some person say older person, and uh, um, there are different ways of looking at it. But I am looking at this issue from uh, the concept of uh, longevity. People are living longer period of time than the, I mean, say 100 years, 200 years. About 200 years, people used to stay, uh, live probably about 30 years. Now the longevity has taken us to 80, 90 years, and we can see people living up to 100, very common among our, our, among our, our, our milieu. And at least, you know, at least two or three person who crossed 100 among your extended circle of friends, relatives, and um, uh, the people whom you know. So if you look at a historical perspective of longevity, number one, the longevity is increasing. So many people say that uh, will it re you know, reach 
100 has longevity in the near future, probably within another 50 years, there's a probability of um, the population, most of the population living up to 100. George, so, tell, me, tell me, Joe, when to change the slide, okay? Yeah, next slide, please. Okay. Next. So, yeah, I'll be mostly covering on some introductory remarks. And I look upon the issue of challenges of longevity. As I mentioned earlier, I look at the issue of aging, issue of older person from a from the perspective of longevity. People are living longer period of time, and that creates challenges and opportunities. So that's what I'll be focusing on. That. So I'll not be looking at the, this concept as an older person or aging issue, but the issue of longevity. This has got conceptual issues. This has got practical issues. So I'll come to that. And also in my presentation, I just wanted to look at the relationship between aging and the COVID pandemic. And today, our defining social experience or human experience is how to live with the COVID pandemic. So the COVID pandemic is also touching the aging population. It presents challenges to the aging. So I'll be briefly touching on that. Then I'll be briefly touch upon the aging and its implication on health. My main argument, my, my presentation is ageism. It's a barrier to healthy aging. So I'll explain what is aging, ageism, and what's implication, how that is acting as a barrier towards healthy aging. And uh, I'll briefly discuss about how to address the ageism, the structural determinants of uh, active aging. And I'll be working towards a manifesto for older person. Manifesto is, we know that it's a political statement. So the politics of aging, I'll be briefly touch upon, and I'll have a few concluding statements. Next slide, please. May I have the next slide, please? Is this okay? okay. Yeah, thank you. Next one, please. Today, Friday, 21st August is a World Senior Citizen Day. And to, this day is for increasing the awareness of the factors and issues that affect senior citizens or older adults or the people experiencing longevity. The age deterioration, the physical deterioration due to longevity, the factors affecting the quality of life, care and support arrangements, abuse of the older persons, the social security needs, social protection issues, intergenerational issues due to demographic shift, gender dimension of um, longevity, participation of older person in social life, institutionalization of older person. So these are the, some of the issues which uh, normally we discuss on uh, World Senior Citizens Day. And today is also a day to recognize and acknowledge the contribution of the people who make to the society, the senior people, how they contribute to the, to the society. Next slide, please. Yes. yes. And um, this presentation has drawn the data and experience gathered from while I was working as the founding secretary general of the Global Commission on Aging in developing countries. It was launched in, um, in Beijing, and I was lead researcher on aging in rural Kerala uh, setting. And I organized and spoken on aging related international conferences in Senegal, China, Bangladesh, Malaysia, and India. And I'm the author of uh, Aging, Learning from the Global South, based on the data from 11 countries from the Global South. So this is the database of my presentation. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. People are, the population are experiencing longevity on the global sense. If you look at this uh, global map, the deep blue are the countries who are experiencing extended longevity, means approximately 80 plus. These are Australia, Canada, interestingly, China from the developing countries. And so these are the countries experiencing uh, people living with uh, 80 are uh, almost uh, touching about um, 18 to 20 percent of the population. So population experiencing longevity but this is not distributed globally uniformly. So this is a very interesting experience, interesting observation. In some countries, there are more older people. In some countries, there are more younger people. 
and this demographic transition or demographic distribution is a very interesting and very important social phenomenon. This has got policy implication, program implication, and also economic implication. I'll come to that very in a, in a, in a few minutes. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. Yes. Next slide, please. Yeah. Yes. yes. Um, when we look at the number, cumulatively, we are talking about almost 160 million people who are living more than 60. That is almost half of the Indian population, if you look at globally, are living and are the age at 60 and above. And by 2050, we are talking about almost 2 billion population will be 60 plus. And this is a significant number of population that is a slightly uh, uh, almost around um, half of the global population will be 60 plus. And the next one, please. And also, if you look at many countries are rapidly, next slide, please. Many countries are rapidly aging, if you look at it in a broader sense. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. If you look at the speed of the longevity, it's also an interesting phenomena. And what we are looking at is that the changing age structure of the population opens up new opportunities. Maybe this is one of the interesting part of when you look at aging and longevity. Aging is looked upon as a, as a spent population. Very limited attention on what are the opportunities presented by the aging population. And I'll be emphasizing on that, what are the opportunities presented by the aging population? Number one, the healthy longevity. If the longevity of the population, if they live healthy, and there's an appropriate condition for economic growth, if the jobs and opportunities are available for the old age population or the senior citizen. And in many countries, particularly in India, in some settings, the retirement age is 56. In the today's context, if you look at the longevity, the 56 young population and who got the capacity to contribute to society, and they could economically contribute, socially contribute. And the, as per the Indian census, 12.4% of the Indian population in 2026 20, will be 60 plus years. It is 173 million all the population by 2026. However, there's a state level variation of all the population population in India is very prominent. See, for example, in the Kerala population in 2021, almost 8.6% of the population is 60 plus. But as of today, 20% of the population is 60 plus, whereas national average is 8.6%. So there's a variation between different states and the national variation. And this is also an interesting phenomenon, and this has got a significant implication. It has got um, implication on aging, and, um, and also it gives economic growth. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned earlier, over 17% of the Kerala population is aged above 65% age. And uh, in the context of COVID, they are strictly stay at home due to the pandemic. And Kerala would now having over 20% of its um, near 30, 35 million population is 60 plus category. And um, according to the COVID prevention strategy, this population is particularly under lockdown situation. But interestingly, this population is also very significantly uh, economic power. And this, this is not uh, explored and what is his contribution towards um, uh, rebuilding the society in the context of a COVID pandemic? Next slide, please. Yeah, at this point, uh, Joe, uh, yes. I would like to, you gave a good example of Kerala and uh, most of the people in India have understood the success of Kerala in the initial days that how well they managed yes. COVID-19 and uh, now probably the things may be slightly different 
But would you like to say how this percentage of the old people in Kerala has played a part in the uh, success of uh, Kerala in dealing with COVID-19? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Have you heard my question? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can Yes, I asked a question. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. Okay. Listen, I can okay. hear you now. Yeah. You can hear me now? Hello? Hello? Yeah, Joe, go ahead with your presentation. We will ask the question later on. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Joe, go ahead. Go ahead. Hello. I can hear you. I think all of us can hear you. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay, can you hear me? I go ahead. I ask. So you may be able to hear me. And um, uh, uh, let me just come back. I think it's our system. Plus another 20 years. But this 20 years, if it's a healthy expectancy, you can contribute towards the society for 20 years. So the policy implication, program implication is increasing our life expectancy for 20 plus years after the 60. So that means a healthy life expectancy after 60, if you can expand more than 20 years, that should be one of the major interventions of the issue of um, aging related interventions. This probably we may not see it that way. So, and uh, 60 plus 20, it could be through uh, employment, it may be through caring for the other family members. It may be through higher education. It may be through learning new skills. So these are the opportunities provided by from the age of 60 to another 20. But in many societies, it's not 20 anymore. This is going to be 60 plus 30. So, so the, the policy intervention is to expand healthy aging from 60 to the, another 30 years. So this is the, the modeling which we may have to look at carefully. So these are the intervention areas which we have to explore, how to expand this healthy aging from the current life expectancy of 60 or 70 to another 20, 25, 30 years. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And also when you look at the health in the older age, it's not a random, it is not a random phenomenon. This is coming through very specific intervention, and also it is coming because of some of the genetic intervention, and then, and also some of the healthy behavior, and access to healthcare, and most importantly, where do you live, and the city in which you live, and the, the town in which you live, in the rural areas in which you live, more, where there is lesser pollution, better access to healthcare. These are the two major important factors. Air pollution is, uh, there is ample data to show that, that reduce uh, healthy life expectancy. We can lose two, uh, two to 10 years of uh, expectancy, healthy life expectancy could be reduced through higher levels of pollution. <laughs> and also our opportunity for um, uh, better health behavior, for example, exercise, healthy, life, healthy uh, food, diet, and also nutritional food is one of the important aspect of um, uh, healthy aging and uh, life, um, and also expanding the uh, life expectancy. Next slide, please.
Next slide, please. Yeah. <laughs> what you have to remember is that every older person is unique and different. Sometime a 60 year old person will be more functional at the age of, at, to a person of 30 year old. And sometime an 80 year old person will be more active than 50 year old. But at the same time, a 50 year old person could be bedridden. So what you have to remember is that older person are different, older person's capacity is different, and the health is a crucial element and how we experience older age. But so older person's health. The basic premise is that every older person is different. Every inter intervention needs are different. <coughs> Next slide, please. <coughs> Next slide, please. Okay, um, let me come back to the issue of aging and COVID pandemic. The impact of epidemic in older adults is very noticeable. And according to the World Health Organization, the data from April 2020, more than 95% of the COVID-19 deaths are among the people over 60 years of age. And more than half of the old deaths occurred are in the people of 80 years plus. And the question is that, is it inevitable or is it um, an avoidable death? If you look at carefully, it seems the death of the older person who are affected by COVID are avoidable, avoidable deaths. And to large extent of the deaths could have been avoided, provided the care was provided on time provided proper care was being discussed about it and provided the message about seek care at the earlier stage, if you'd have been part of the prevention message, probably we could have avoided the high level of um, death among the older person. If you look at the data of Sweden, 90% of the deaths from COVID-19 were among the people of more than 70 years of age. In China, the COVID-19 case fatality rate was only 3.6% of the adults. But 8% of those in their 70s experienced that, and 14%, 8% of all the people of 80 year plus are experienced a high level of fatality rate. And also when we look at the impact of COVID pandemic on the older person, it varies. And it is changing the older person's value in the society. In the society where the value of older person is appreciated, they are likely to live longer. This is an interesting part of it. A society where an older person is undervalued, that person is likely to die earlier. And older people are being challenged by the requirement to spend more time at home. And lack of physical contact with other family members, friends and colleagues, and temporary cessation of employment and other activities, and anxiety and fear of illness and death are contributing towards the quality of life and the well-being well of the older persons are being Im impacted than people of other age group. And also, this is the right time to look at look at the op opportunities to create and to foster healthy aging and during the pandemic. The COVID pandemic is actually giving us an opportunity to look at the needs of the older population. Next slide, please. <clears throat> And um, to understand what's happening about the older person, what's happening into the health, what's happening into the COVID-related response, you have to understand a phenomenon called ageism. I would say ageism is a major barrier for a healthy aging and, uh, and a productive aging. Ageism is a concept of a prejudice or it's a discrimination on the grounds of a person's age and age and ingrained in the Indian society. In India, we may say that uh, we, we, we pro provide reverence to the older people, but if you look at an age, aged person on the street, look at that person, and probably what we claim is not what we practice quite often. <clears throat> and also I would say that our ideas of old age is an old idea itself. Understanding about aging, our understanding about how to utilize the opportunities and capacity, innate ability of the older people, we haven't looked at it carefully. And when you look at the ageism, 
It manifests through stereotyping and discriminating against older persons on the basis of their chronological age. So if the person is 60 plus, that person is excluded from the development dialogue. That person is excluded from the, the quality of life related issues. That person is quite often excluded from wider issues about the development of the older person itself. Ageism is also practice of the denial of the basic human rights of older person, and it is considered as one of the most pervasive prejudice across the human society. And when you look at the discrimination and the exclusion of the older people, the prevalence is very high. It's very higher than what we anticipated. And also there are various social forces that present negative depiction of the older adults and aging process as an undesirable trait. If you look at some of the advertisements, always older person is depicted as an undesirable image. Older person is presented in a negative form. Older person is presented as a person of um, ill health. And an older person is always presented as a person who can adapt to the society and so on. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes, and also when you look at the ageism on health, the ageism is creating very harmful effect on the health of all the others. Let's look at how it is happening. And um, there is a data shows ageism has the, the older person who are discriminated by the society, they experience higher level of cardiovascular stress and they have lower levels of self-efficacy and decreased productivity. The way the society is, uh, give or treat older person with a negative attitude, they're likely to experience cardiovascular um, stress. And also the negative attitude are also widely present even within the health and social care setting where older adults are most vulnerable. And also social ingrained ageism can become self-fulfilling and promoting the older person stereotype which lead to socialization and subsequently physical and cognitive decline. And again, it leads towards lack of physical activity and economic burden. And also what we're noticing is that um, in some of the medical setting, all the person's clinical diagnostic results are not taken into consideration when they look at a, a, a clinical intervention. And also what we notice is that in quite often, all the people are subjected to all clinical diagnostic practices, but that is mostly for, uh, for the billing purpose. But that data and evidence is not utilized for a clinical decision making. That is very prevalent in many of the clinical setting. And, and also we have to remember that in the Indian context, we don't have a, a, a specialty of a geriatric care. There are very few medical universities are offering geriatric care as a specialization. And geriatric care is often part of other speciality, not even expanded and developed into a, a speciality itself. Thank you. Next slide, please. And the next slide, please. And also how to address ageism. What you remember is that what influences health in older age? There's individual level, there are a set of behaviors, age-related changes, the physical changes, uh, uh, and the genetic situation and overall disease profile are the, some of the individual issues in, impacting on the health of the older people. But increasingly, there is a huge percentage of environmental situation where we live is impacting on the quality of life of quality and well-being of the population. The most important is the, the quality of the housing. Access to housing is an important factor for the well-being of the older person. <clears throat> And the second is assistive technologies, technologies which um, aid the person's mobility, technologies which aid the person to hearing aid and uh, eyesight, and also transport facility, especially geared to the needs of the older population. And in the transport policy, what we call it as um, the last mile connectivity, the last mile connectivity is quite often linked with, um, with the mobility of the older person because they may to. Uh, take a transportation from their, their uh, residence to the nearest transport hub. And that transport hub, that, uh, that last mile connectivity 
is most important for the older person. In many Indian cities, they use um, cycle rickshaws or um, auto other rickshaws. But access to that those um, mode of transportation is an important issue. And uh, last not least, the social facilities. For example, the capacity and opportunity of the older person to live, to contact with other people, spend their time with other people, and also to, uh, to engage in the social connectivity, <laughs> which also include uh, access to uh, care, and which is um, uh, which is relevant and also affordable kind of care for for them. Next slide, please. And see, most importantly, what you have to remember is that um, for looking at the aged care, looking at uh, the structural determinants of care and the well-being of older people, different sectors need to work together. For example, we have to look at the workplace. The, the idea of retirement itself needs to be looked upon. For example, people at the, after certain stage, at certain age, they don't have to work for eight hours, but probably they have to work maybe less than eight hours. But then we have to revise our um, the age-related definition. Aging is not sorry. Work is normally uh, defined as eight hours work, but in the aging context, we have to define work as lesser hours. And also the definition of the age at what to what extent, till what age they can work, a part-time basis or a consultancy basis. So workplace arrangement for all the people need to be revised. And also one of the major issue about older people is their frailty is linked with nutrition, particularly micronutrition. Urban planning related with uh, safety, mobility, and also the sense of safety. One of the study which we did in Kerala study, almost 8% of the population, they reported that the sense of the fear of violence are their main fear because they suspect that um, they may be physically violated because of their frailty. And also we know that there is a need for a, a range of social welfare intervention opportunities need to be worked on that. And also I mentioned earlier, housing, transport, health, social welfare, urban planning, nutrition, work, all these sectors need to work together to look at a better care and also better quality of life of the older person. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. And also there is a movement by WHO, what they call it as age-friendly cities and communities. So that those communities and cities, they declare that um, they're age-friendly. That is related with the mobility of the older people, that is related with the social care, social support opportunities, that is related with their social connectivity, that is related with the cultural mechanism for connecting with the people. And also most importantly, the gender dimensions of aging. Even though there are more women are likely to live longer life than men, but their quality of life suffer. But all this are taken into consideration of the concept called uh, age-friendly cities and communities. This is uh, one of the issues which uh, our panchayat, our municipal corporation, maybe I look at how to provide care and support for the older people by facilitating age-friendly facilities. That is most importantly, the cities are, are they age-friendly or mobility-friendly. This is one of the major aspects of um, age-friendly cities and initiative. And I hope this is an opportunity to major cities to take a look at it, how age-friendly those cities are. Pune, when we talk about um, our mobility, our metro, probably it's an opportunity to think about our last mile connectivity, which connect the old people with the, with the wider transport system. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Next slide, please. And if you look at some of the main recommendations that we have to promote healthy aging across the life course and prevent functional decline and disease among the older people. And this is through reducing the exposure to risk factors and promote healthy behavior across the life course. And also this is about empowering the people to maintain their health as they grow, grow old. <clears throat> Maximizing the functional ability and preventing functional decline of, and in health among the older people through two different aspects, by preventing falls and also by preventing dementia. These are the two major aspects which is contributing negatively towards um, health and well-being of the older population. Next slide, please. 
and there are many examples of the good practices in local local intervention and we have very many examples from uh, japan and why japan because japan is one of the the senior most population group in the in the entire world and uh, their life expectancy is almost 90 and 100 is quite often and the, the most important aspect is the prevention programs are provided by municipalities and other local self-help governments. They are providing programs and they're managing programs for the older people. And most often these programs are managed by the older person themselves. So there are two things. The elderly programs are provided by the municipalities and the panchayats, and it's, they're managed by the elderly population themselves. These are the two principles you have to remember when you think about intervention among the older population. Next slide, please. And also, we have to think about reorient the health system to respond to the needs of older population. In fact, the COVID pandemic demonstrated the need for looking at the, the care and the needs of the older population very carefully. In the initial phase of the older population, it's almost taken for granted that all the people are going to die without taking into consideration the clinical care and clinical knowledge we, acc we accumulated. So I would say that all the population and their role is rediscovered in the context of a COVID pandemic. And also we have to integrate aging in the national health plans. What you remember mm -hmm. is that in the Indian context, there is no national uh, senior citizens policy right now. We have a policy which is created about almost um, 10 year, 12 years ago. We haven't revised this for almost 12 years. And this is a similar case for them in the state, states as well. And I would even say that uh, when the population of the Indian uh, population, when they cross 60 of 20% of the population, government of India may have to think about an, a minister for aged to address the, the, the needs of aging population. When it is crosses 20%, there should be a Minister of Aged, Department of Aged that's already here, but there is a Ministry of Aged that's, that will be another political demand which we may have to put forward. And also make sure that aging-related pol policies and plans are part of all the programs, all the policies on a national level. Next slide, please. And also we have to, as I mentioned earlier, we have to reorient the health system to respond to the needs of all the population. What you have to remember is that even in the context of COVID pandemic, it is not essential that all people have to die. All people are dying because we haven't built up the skill of the healthcare providers to provide care for the COVID, all the COVID uh, patients. And we haven't looked at the skills of the appropriate skills of the healthcare providers to ensure the health and well being of the older population. And also we had to look at the concept of equity in health financing and the financial protection. Remember, you have to think about financing for the people. When you look at the health budget is drawn up, we have very limited health related allocation for the older population. And this is against the principle of health equity and health justice. And this is another issue which we may have to look at carefully and much in depth. And the last point in this sector is access to essential medicines and health technology. We talk about health technology, we look at uh, innovative practices, but there are, see for example, when you look at the innovations in uh, hearing aid, innovations in mobility, innovations in uh, physical aid for the people to move, and there are different innovations in the mobility by wheelchair, uh, the electrified or a mechanical, um, um, no, wheelchairs. So there is a need for industrialization of old people. <clears throat> but what you have to remember is that um, the innovations in the old people and the industrialization needs of the older po old population should be promoted as a policy framework. And what you have to remember is that there is a range of industrial products has to come out for the betterment and well-being of the older population. This needs to be promoted, and this innovation should be promoted through in the broader framework of the policies and procedures. Next, next slide, please. <coughs> and uh, most important thing is strengthening the evidence base on aging and health. 
when we look at the aging from a sustainable development framework, aging has got sort of implication on, on several sustainable development goals, SDG 1, SDG 2, SDG 3, SDG 14, SDG 16. There are several sustainable uh, goals are directly linked with um, either aging and uh, longevity. But one of the main problems we are facing is that the data we require is not often coming in the context of older population. For example, when we look at the data, many of the data related to the older population ends by 80, 80 plus. We don't have the cohort of 80 to 90, 90 to 100. Data about that cohort is quite often missing from the general population data. And also we don't even capture the data. When, when we did a rural study, and even in our data collection, the data collectors, they didn't collect the data from 80. They just put 80 plus instead of actually collecting the data. And when we analyze the data, what we notice, about 50% of the older population do belongs to 85 plus. But we don't have the data to disaggregate this and say that who are the person who need additional care, additional clinical care, additional medical care because there is simply there is no data. And also the study on the global aging and adult health, we have to look at the data on a centenarian basis. And the data collection should not stop at the age of 60. Even many of the data collection will say 65 plus or 80 plus and stop there, not unpacking the data. And another major important is that segregated data on a gender base, male, female segregation, of the data and based on the, 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 the quality of the data and the, what is the mortality and morbidity data all of the older population. <clears throat> and most importantly, we had a constantly review of the policies, laws, and action, and that is their implication on aging population. This should be a constant issue, but unfortunately, our policy or aging policy is not yet updated for several years. Probably that's one of the urgent calls for the for today's call is that um, update our aging-related policies, come out with the national and new national policy on aging. And most importantly, our knowledge transition, our understanding about aging population, our approach towards uh, older population, and our approach towards longevity, this should be looked upon as new framework. And this knowledge transition need to be done through the schools to education system, through the medical colleges, through the schools of public health. So I would strongly emphasize the need to look at the aging related knowledge creation and the knowledge transition. And this is an urgent need for um, looking at the aging related well-being. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and I have to make a few concluding remarks. The longevity of the human being and actually it's an outcome of the human progress in health, in human progress in our uh, ability to treat people, in our ability to provide uh, um, nutritious food, better healthcare, all this is uh, cumulatively contributing towards longevity. But at the same time, we have created um, policies and programs to, re to recap the benefit of the longevity. We don't have a system policies, knowledge framework to capture the benefit of longevity. Even though we achieved longevity, we haven't created the policy and institutional framework to capture the benefit of longevity. This is one of the major drawbacks of our approach towards longevity and aging population. And also remember the aging population presents an opportunity for social development, which I would call it a second demographic dividend. There's a particular demographic population of aging population that is 60 plus 20 years, they could contribute to a society in terms of um, resource, in terms of knowledge, in terms of a skill, in terms of managing in various social forces. And also this is a call for today as International Day for Senior Citizens. It's an opportunity, it's a call for a national and state level policies to address the challenges of longevity, aging and the issues of older person. The national policy on older person in 1999 was yet to be updated. And probably today's major take home message is that we should request to the government to come out with a new national policy on older person as a priority basis. Thank you very much. And um, I would like to take a few questions if you have any.
Thank you. Yeah, okay. So, uh, Mr. Dharmendra Kumar, are you able to hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? Mr. Uh, are, you able, you are you able to hear me? You can switch off the slides, please. Yeah, I switched off. Okay. Yes. Let's go on. Oh. Please use the chat facility for asking questions, please. Hello. Yes, I'm able to hear you, Priya Duara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, it's a, Dr. Gio Thomas has given a very good presentation. Hello. Yes, yes go, ahead. go ahead. Yeah, it's it's a. <clears throat> As a World Senior Citizens Day, there are, uh, as per the COVID pandemic, there are uh, several uh, <coughs> things to be looked out by the governments in the global world. <coughs> there are several uh, uh, things which uh, pandemic has created as far as the health systems are concerned in the different countries. So the strengths and weaknesses of the health systems and health uh, sector has to be reoriented exclusively towards the senior citizens of the countries. And we have no adequate policies as Dr. Gio Thomas has outlined. We have no state level policies nor national level policies after 1999. So there is enough uh, uh, space for the governments to look after and redesign the policies for exclusively for senior citizens for the coming for the coming days and uh, this is the world senior citizens day where and that during the pandemic uh, uh, year where the governments and the societies as well as the communities has to look after all these things keeping in mind the welfare of the society and the happiness of the society Thank you very much to all of you, and uh, we hope the governments will take the necessary actions and necessary policies, uh, state governments as well as the national governments. Thank you very much. Thank, I thank think very well. we, we can see your, your uh, opinion and suggestion is taken very well. And probably one of the take home message from today's presentation is we may have to request to the state and national government to look at the aging policy and come out with the national aging policy as a priority basis. Thank you. Thank you for um, highlighting that issue, Dr. Rao. Yeah, thank you. Any, any other questions? You just go ahead. Raise your hand and uh, there are, there unmute your there microphone. Is a, there, there is a question here. There is a question here. From, um, from Selena, uh, Selena um, you, you are aware of the old days and the old age and the same Is it the same universal aging for people who are the same age? See, the question is. See, the, the question related to the question related to the HIV AIDS. For, um, remember, we talk about the COVID pandemic. We are also going through a similar epidemic in the, in the country, the HIV AIDS epidemic. And interestingly, in the, in the difference between COVID pandemic and AIDS pandemic, in the COVID pandemic, we talk about uh, vaccines, but whereas for the last 40 years, we talked about vaccine for AIDS, but still there is no vaccine for AIDS. So if you look at that as a simple, that's an ex a lessons learned to the context of um, COVID pandemic, the lesson from the vaccine research in the AIDS pandemic is not very exciting uh, to learn for the, the COVID pandemic. So 40 years research in the vaccine for AIDS hasn't yield any, resu any result. So that could be a sobering experience. So when you look at the 
the, the research in the area of um, um, uh, the, the vaccine for the COVID pandemic. Please remember that. But one of the interesting factors which happened in the, the HIV epidemic is that there is a, an expansion of the treatment opportunities, antiretroviral treatment opportunities for the AIDS patients. Are, there are extremely vast number of um, different generation, one, two, three, four, five generations of a treatment opportunities. Because of that, what happened, the longevity of the people living with HIV AIDS is expanded. So what you're remembering is that the people living with HIV AIDS are may, may be dying of the age, age old related epidemic, not necessarily with AIDS alone. At some point in time, probably we may have treatment opportunities for the COVID pandemic, may not have a vaccine, if you look at the lessons from AIDS pandemic. At the same time, the, what you have to remember is that when we talk about aging population, there are different populations, subgroups. There are different people living with a different kind of illness, for example, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and also there are different kinds of illness, there are different kinds of um, uh, uh, life experience, people from the urban area, rural area, people without access and also socioeconomic condition. There are people with pension, without pension. So all this to be taken into consideration when we look at policies and program of aged population, the diversity of the population. That's the most important thing. Diversity in terms of health, diversity in, the, in terms of the experience and the lived experience. So this is a take home message. Diversity of the older person. Thank you. Very good. Uh, I have uh, Achilles Sari. IIT days. Akhilesh, if you are still there, you can unmute and ask the question. Well, he is not there. So I give a chance to others. Anyone else for questions? Joe, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah, maybe maybe you can ask you questions yourself. I, I want to ask a question. Yes, uh, go ahead. This is uh, Dr. Meena Cherian. I'm yes. calling from Switzerland. And okay. uh, since I've worked a lot with World Health Organization, and uh, my experience is also very recently in the COVID uh, guidelines for WHO for the old people. So I would like to know, and I'm sorry, I could not connect earlier for some reason. It was technical problem, but I would like to know what, uh, uh, you know, your group or uh, this uh, university is doing to address the, uh, you know, the, the technique, the knowledge amongst older people, because, uh, you know, sharing knowledge and allaying the anxiety there's so many ways and we can go on and on that's a completely different uh, forum but i just want to know uh, has tech, because technology has advanced so much everybody does have mobile phones and we are looking from the geneva Foundation for medical education and research where i'm based here and i work for them uh, how can we help or assist and collaborate on this technology for older people. Uh, thank you, Dr. Meena Sharian, and uh, nice to see you after a long time, and uh, welcome to the webinar. And um, uh, it, since you mentioned about what university could do, let me just briefly <clears throat> mention about the context of this seminar. And um, I let me congratulate and thank the Vice Chancellor and the Executive President of the MIT World Peace University and this meeting is hosted by the School of Public Health at the, schools, um, at the Faculty of Sustainability Studies. And um, I, I was allowed to host this conference and uh, all the technical support is provided by the university and I acknowledge the contribution. And uh, our School of Public Health, the first master's in public health is already on and the, the new batch will begin uh, on, um, on 14th of September. I am very glad to report that. In fact, some of our PhD students are looking at the COVID pandemic and aging. And I was very surprised, you know, they had the audacity to think about that relationship, even though it's very obvious, because the COVID pandemic is a pandemic for all the, all the population. We somehow forgot about it. 
and we are taking for granted that people are going to die from person comorbidities. But comorbidities is not a reason for, for deaths. Comorbidities are the, they are testing the skills of the care, care provider. Comorbidities test them, the clinical skills of the doctor. So maybe let me put it that way. So we didn't provide the knowledge base for the healthcare provider. In the COVID pandemic, <clears throat> maybe one of the mitigation effort is, effort is <clears throat> two things. One is a rapid um, a, a mapping of the research needs for the older population and COVID pandemic. And number two, probably we had to look at immediately updating or update the, the clinical practices related to the COVID pandemic for the older population. A national protocol needs to be carefully looked at immediately. Third, I would say that there is a need for a, what are the innovations, industrialization required, the products required for enhancing the well-being of the population. It could be related to the, uh, mobility, clinical care, technological assistance for the older population, even diagnostic equipments for the older population. So I would suggest that there is a need for looking at what are the innovation support we need to look at the well-being of the older population. And definitely it should be in the framework of the national policy on aging, which we terribly we are lacking. That's one of the, the tragedy for today, I would say that. So when I come back to your, your question number one, we need to look at the research needs of the older population in the context of COVID and in the overall context. Number two, we have to look at the speciality like a geriatric care with a very strong structural determinants, looking at the structural determinants of aging and, and aging related well-being. So these are the two major reasons we have to initiate the university level research program. I would even say a national research, priority research on aging and COVID pandemic. In the broader context of what are the new research required for the COVID pandemic, academic research, clinical research, and pharmaceutical related uh, pharmacopoeia research, a range of research we need to look at it in the national, national aging policy and with a special emphasis on what are the industrialization innovation requirements. Thank you. I'm just contributing towards that ongoing discussion. Thank you, Dr. Sharia. What is this Such a... Thank you. Mm -hmm. If no one has a, uh, I have a, uh, a suggestion or suggestion or really, if nobody else has, can I take a minute? Yes, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. More minutes, yeah, right. So, uh, thanks for answering uh, that, Dr. Joe. Uh, I would, I would like. I know the research is a, is of course, you know, as a university, you'll be doing. Is there some some low hanging fruits like, for example, uh, as I said, using the technology, uh, mobile technology, etc., just to see first of all the assessment, actually how many older people or their carers uh, have access of what they have undergone, what are their needs, and 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 we and I know a few people who are doing, of course, in India and uh, would be very happy to collaborate to form a very simple uh, you know which would take should not take more than three minutes kind of a survey to to complete to see you know the assess assess what they were they, what are the gaps and that could be then taken by universities to address each one but uh, would that be a possibility would that be something in a collaborative manner that all of with all of you over here experts we could uh, uh, do or we could assist or in in which way i'm just throwing a idea and it is really up to you because it's your uh, call yeah and, and thank you dr meena and it's a uh, fantastically welcome idea we'll be quite happy to collaborate with you and uh, i mean today we have about 65 participants but um, more than 800 people registered for this conference. So we have the contact detail with us. We'll be quite happy to reach out to them, even though some people may not attend the conference, but they're interested in this, this particular process. So we will be quite happy to reach out to them. And from on behalf of the School of Public Health, I'll be quite happy to coordinate this study and you know we can have a rapid assessment. 
And when we mentioned about the research needs, I would say one, one of the important issue is the post-COVID um, recovery issues. Even though we say that we have a very high level of recovery rate, but the debilitating effect of the post-COVID phenomena is very high. People are not coming, they cannot come back to the work, work life immediately after the COVID recovery. So the idea of COVID recovery is lingering on. It is not lingering since just because of your, your test is turned out to be negative and you're discharged, you're expected to come back to your workplace. But that debilitating effect is a long period of time, different kinds of symptoms, different kinds of manifestation. And I would say that there's an urgent need for data to look at the continuing manifestation of the post-COVID recovery phase. So this could be easily, we can come out with a regular routine, <clears throat> non-clinical question, questioning the part of it. And this, if you could take the initiative, we'll be quite happy to, to engage and uh, the large scale of people we could reach out easily. Thank you, thank you for taking up the issue. And definitely as part of this, um, this webinar, if you'd come out with a, a collaborative research project, that would be great, fantastic. And I also hope others also could uh, uh, extend their interest and we will be quite happy to put it together. And that this idea could be shared among everybody by email. Thank you. Thank you. It yeah, looks like uh, no one has further questions. Uh, anyone uh, would like to ask? We have one, one more minute before we conclude. So go ahead with ask, otherwise we'll conclude with some kind of an uh, resolution which I would like to suggest. Okay, seeing none, uh, uh, thank you for a very active participation. Uh, but one of the things which was quite striking in the presentation of uh, uh, Dr. Thomas and in India for dealing with the senior citizens which are aged and uh, since 1999 which is uh, more than about 20 years uh, the, whatever the policy India had has not been up it, uh, updated, amended or no new policies in a place. It is a pretty sensitive issue because as I said in the introduction, uh, the children are always encouraged, adults are always respected, but the uh, aged senior citizens are excluded from our everyday issues. Now, the, it looks like there is a standard assumption that we all have to support the old people. We never thought of whether old people can support us, the society, some way or the other. That is because the older people look old. So everything depends on the look. And it also everything depends on the physical strength of the person. But haven't we seen some of the disabled or people who are still able to participate in the sport, races. Once we start telling the old people that they are beneficial to the society, then their whole outlook will change. Maybe they will be encouraged, the way we encourage our children to participate in uh, various activities. So why not we make a resolution? And I'm sure uh, Dr. Thomas will be in a touch with each one of you, and I will support it that each one will give you some input in terms of developing a new resolution to be given to the government of India to develop either a new policy or update of the old policy for towards the old senior citizens. So this is my suggestion. And um, if anyone has any other suggestion, probably they can write to Dr. Thomas or me and uh, we can then take it from there. Uh, Dr. Thomas, any last word? I have a, a, a concluding statement. And uh, ideally, uh, what I wish to do is 
to come out with a, a manifesto for the people. Mm -hmm. And manifesto is actually a political statement. And this has got very significant. For example, if you look at the, the green movement, there are green parties by the realization that um, unless there's a political mobilization revolving around the greening issues, the policy may not change. And I could see that almost 20% of the Indian voters are aging population. They should come out with a, a national a manifesto for what are the rights and responsibilities of older people. I'll be quite happy to draft it and present it. This is not one party or one with this one. This is across the border. We should look at um, a, a political mobilization strategy of the older population. If you need any political challenges, policy challenges, probably look at the political mobilization of older people based on a minimum a political manifesto. And I don't know how it will be accepted by many people, but unless we have a political manifesto for older people, our discussion about uh, older population may not move forward. That exactly the reason there is no national uh, older po policy. And if you look at our national leaders, both ruling party, opposition party, any party, the senior leaders are older citizen, senior citizen. But <laughs> to the, I mean, it's not. A, I mean, all the opinion makers, decision makers in Indian context are senior citizen. But okay. Point, when you look at the resource allocation policy issues, that particular issue is not converted into the, the policy making process. So this can be addressed only through a political manifesto or as a tool for campaigning and all the people's manifesto for the Indian population. I'll be quite happy to draft it and um, put it across for our future follow-up activities. Yeah, we can also look at the Switzerland's policy, for example. Uh, Dr. Meena Nathan was the information from Switzerland how the older population is taken care of or how they are integral part of the society that yeah. that could be uh, feasible but also maybe we should leverage on the world health organization's uh, current guidance on these policies because if they have, there is a they have created an entire uh, department or you could say a program on aging and uh, since you were talking about i know we're taking a little longer than your time but i just want to uh, add, uh, you know uh, highlight what dr shinde said about people think about older people without you know they have a, a set idea and it's really called ageism so we we try to put them in a box and it's called ageism so we could we could i could just assist i have to keep it short i just saying i'm very happy to work with all of you very good thank you so uh, joe are you still there yes i am here i'm here okay so may i conclude and uh, i just wanted to invite all the delegates attention all the participants attention to my book on aging in developing countries. We looked at the aging policy from um, 11 countries. If anybody is interested, please take a look at that. The link is given in the announcement. And also, I hope we may be able to do the follow up on this uh, this seminar, looking at aging and different aspect of it. And one of the issues is that minimum standards of care for the older people and minimum standards of care for the older homes, because we have thousands of old age homes in India, but without any regulatory framework, without any particular minimum standards of care. So we have a huge area of work in the area of aging and the well-being is, is, is still remaining from the policy level and the, and the aged care level and also diagnostic and, and the geriatric care teaching training and a range of issues. And it's amazing that um, how this particular population is left out of the, the mainstream attention from the our political and social leaders, our opinion leaders. Thank you very much, and um, I thank uh, uh, Dr. Rajendra Shinde, and also I thank um, Dr. N.T. Rao, the Vice Chancellor of MIT World Peace University. Let me thank uh, Dr. E.P., Executive President of the MIT World Peace University, uh, Dr. Uh, Rahul Karad, for, utilize, for allowing us to utilize their uh, facilities for um, hosting this conference. And I am um, and I'm very proud to host this on behalf of the School of Public Health. And I hope some of my students are here and I thank them. And um, I hope this was useful for some of you. 
and please remember i conclude this saying that my effort was to initiate a dialogue initiate a discussion not necessarily to uh, take a logical conclusion on many of the issues which i tried to raise and um, I, i hope i achieved the objective of initiating a discussion in today's context thank you very much for uh, being part of this um, uh, expertise and also there is a feedback form is distributed if you can fill it up that will be great help thank you very much thank you all thank you for your contribution bye हेलो सर यस सर प्लीज सेंड फीडबैक फॉरम ये आई जस्ट सेंडिंग इट आई डोंट नो व्हाट हैपन सर प्लीज सेंड फीडबैक फॉरम या हेलो यस या सॉरी सर वॉइस इज नॉट क्लियर